Well, things are and and how do they recruit in this environment? We talked to lockdown recruit expert Brock Smith today. Lock on Hawkeyes. You are locked on Hawkeyes, your daily podcast on the Iowa Hawkeyes. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Brent Condon, and this is the Locked On Hawkeyes podcast. Thanks for making Locked On Hawkeyes your first listen every day. Big thank you to everybody hitting that subscribe button on YouTube. If you can help us out, just takes a moment, helps us get in front of more Hawkeye fans. These days, every new potential hire can feel like a high stakes wager for your small business. That's why LinkedIn Jobs helps find the right people for your team faster and for free. Post your job for free at LinkedIn.com slash Locked On College. Terms and conditions apply. Well, today is a day where time to talk a little recruiting. We know that the recruiting class is all but signed, sealed, and delivered at this point. Now, with the struggles offensively, you do have some concerns about that. And at this point, and Aiden Kirk Ferentz, the offensive philosophy that is stuck in the mud, how does Iowa recruit? And how does their future quarterback look in James Rezar, who will be coming in next season? We'll talk about that a whole lot more coming up here with Lockdown's recruiting analyst, Brian Smith. But first, we mentioned Kirk Ferentz. We know it's coming to an end. Be it this year, two years, five years, whenever it is, this is not going to go on in perpetuity. And many of the comments that I'm seeing from a lot of people, and I think it rings incredibly true, is this is not a kingdom. This is not a right. When Kirk Ferentz hangs it up, whenever that proves to be, Iowa football will continue. And though there's times that it feels like there's some people that don't believe that, it will. Iowa football will go on, good, bad, or indifferent. If the program continues on a similar path, has success, will eligibility almost every single year, it will continue. It very well could crater. It could get ugly. Or there is that next level in a new Big Ten where Iowa is able to take a step forward from what they are for all the success of Kirk Ferentz and there's tons of it he has not won a Big Ten championship since 2004 with all the success of Kirk Ferentz he has won one major bowl game in an Orange Bowl he has won two division titles in the current format playing in the worst division in college football I argue that there was a lot left on the table, and there was a lot left on the table and what this program could have been with a competent offense. It doesn't take a scientist to figure this one out, right? You don't need to be a rocket scientist to get to this one. You look at what I has been. Offensively is where the issues lie. And with the great defense, with great special teams, what could have been? And that's where the frustration lies, I think, for a lot of people, knowing that this could have been more that there could have been more than one division championship over the last eight years. That there easily could have been maybe even a Big Ten championship. You know, the Iowa philosophy under Kirk Ferentz worked very well for a very long time. And it gave them a chance against the elites. But with this offense cratering, those chances are gone. 31 nothing this year to Penn State. A year ago against Michigan in a game that the final score did not indicate the domination that the Wolverines had. Of course, the game before that against Michigan in the Big Ten Championship game in 2021 and how the wheels completely fell off there. Last year in Ohio State, things got ugly. And when you're taking on the top-level teams, that's what gave you hope, is that you could hang around, make a play, and pull an upset. And those days appear to be gone. Those days appear to be over. So how does this play out? How does this end? Beth gets the interim athletic director is in such a difficult spot. And her predecessor and Gary Barta did a terrible job. Instead of being a big boy, instead of being an adult, instead of being an administrator, he took the easy way out. He put this cockamamie 25 points per game addition into the contract. He reduced a little bit of salary. Brian Ferentz is still making over $800,000. But instead of doing his job, he was Brian Ferentz's 
That's who he had the answer to, was the athletic director. And instead of doing something with teeth, even bad teeth, instead, he took the easy way out. And then he left Beth Getz, or if it is another athletic director, whoever gets that job, in an incredibly difficult spot. You hear people talk about Beth Getz. They talk in glowing terms about what a wonderful administrator that she is, how great she is at her job, that she has so much upside in that role, that she's going to be incredible, that she's going to do an amazing job in this role if she eventually gets it. But one of her first biggest orders of business is going to be either making the phone call to Kirk Ferentz, you need to fire your son, or I'm going to fire your son, or we need to push you out the door. A Hall of Fame coach, and that's the position that Beth Getz is going to be. And it very well could be before she even becomes the full-time athletic director. And if this gets ugly, if this gets stucky, sticky, you know, the big money people absolutely, for the most part, all love Kirk Ferentz. And are fine allowing him to have the chiefdom that he has in Iowa football. And now she has to make that choice. It's incredibly difficult. Will Brian Ferentz do the right thing and walk away? Well, he should have last year. We know that's not the case. His offenses are tarnishing his father's legacy, and it's looking more and more ugly for the Ferentz family and the legacy of Kirk Ferentz. How does Iowa recruit in this environment? We're going to talk about that coming up here with our recruiting analyst, Brian Smith. We will get into that. Also, the future, they do have a quarterback committed for next year in James Rezar. We will get into that. How does Iowa recruit? an aging head coach in Kirk Ferentz, an offense that is absolutely brutal. How do you do that? How do you keep guys on board that are committed offensively? We will talk about that as we continue here. This is the Locked On Hawkeyes podcast. Today's episode of Locked On is brought to you by Picks. I absolutely love Price Picks and what they're doing right now, an opportunity for you to get involved with them. You're just getting very simply higher or lower when it comes to games coming up for the weekend. It's a really cool idea, an incredible look at how to do things and how to give yourself a chance to win to 25 times. That's right, 25 times the amount that is out there that you put down. And also coming up here, it's an incredible stuff that they have, an opportunity for you to get a match, put $100 into your account, get $100 back. That's absolutely incredible what they're doing with Prospect. Love what the Price Picks is doing right now and your opportunity to get involved with them. What you want to do right now is sign up with our promo code. It's locked on. Very simple. Locked on is the prize code to uh, the promo code to get involved with that opportunity for you to do that and help yourself out this fall season. Today's episode is also brought to you by LinkedIn. And LinkedIn, of course, our presenting sponsor of all our recruiting coverage here on the LinkedIn network. These days, every new potential hire can feel like a high stakes wager for your small company. That's why you want to hit up LinkedIn Jobs. LinkedIn Jobs is something that I use for me and my small business. Super easy to use. You get the purple hiring hashtag there. Let's you know that you are hiring. I've used it before. It's so easy to create that free job post on LinkedIn Jobs. And they have simple tools like screening questions that make the focus on candidates with just the right skills and experience so you can quickly prioritize who you'd like to interview and hire. It's why small businesses rate LinkedIn Jobs number one in delivering quality hires versus leading competitors. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the qualified candidates you want to talk to. Post your job for free at LinkedIn.com slash lockdown college again that's linkedin slash lockdown college to post you for free terms and conditions apply right now happy to be joined by brian smith our recruiting analyst here on the lockdown network and always when we get an opportunity to talk with brian brian it's been a while how are things on the floor ah uh, they're going well man just uh enjoying the finally the uh cooler weather than what we've been having and uh, right in the middle of football season, basketball starting, hockey, everything. It's a good time of year. Uh, no doubt about it. The World Series is set. We got college football coming down to the final month plus of the season. And here on, on Hawkeye, we've been talking about, obviously, the offense. As we see the defense still playing at an elite level, the special teams playing at an elite level. And then you have, well, another part of the team. You still got to play a little offense here. Now, I was never been known as a team offensively. That is great. But they're at least competent. And the competency has completely fallen off 
the last couple of years. It has created to a level unthinkable for anybody at a power structure. And you, with your background in recruiting, taking Kirk Ferentz's age aside, taking the nepotism with his son, Brian Ferentz, just in general, when you have something that is incre- that's struggling, offense, you think of defense at USC, things like that, does it make it more difficult to recruit just that general area? For Iowa, is it make it more difficult to find players when you see just how bad it is? It absolutely does. And for Iowa, it's on a whole nother level anyway because there are the, the butt of jokes around college football now. Uh, some of the guys that I know, social media, et cetera, make fun of Iowa that don't normally follow them, but they're so bad that they will just randomly take shots at Iowa. I mean, kids are going to read that stuff, especially if it's on social media. So absolutely. And if you looked at, you know, Iowa's recruiting 10 years ago on offense compared to now, without even researching it, I would bet pretty strongly that the wide receiver board and stuff like that, probably a little better back then. Um you're right, though. The nepotism and everything that goes along with having your son as the OC, that's a dangerous, dangerous walk, my friend. Uh, he's out on the plank with it. And I think Brent's is kind of to the point where he just doesn't care. If you want to fire me, go ahead, but I'm not going to fire my kid. But you let him hire his kid. So I was put themselves in this situation. I, I don't know how you get out of it. They really have. It's incredibly difficult, and the change needs to happen philosophically. You know, and one thing that I do say watching this team is we've seen for basically three or four years the old blocking scheme. It's what Kirk Ferentz did for so long in the NFL and, of course, back in his college days, the zone blocking scheme. Well, what the change of the rules, I think it was five years ago, where he basically couldn't cut block at all anymore. And that outside backer or the defensive end that in the past you'd be able to cut and get that outside zone play to work, it doesn't work anymore. It just frankly doesn't work. You can block it perfectly. You could have a great running back, but there are just so many times that that backside guy is able to get in there. And what should be a 7-10 yard gain is a 2-yard loss. So they all pass. We very rarely see them run any outside zone anymore. They evolved what they do in the running game. More counters, more ISO, more straight up blocking. They've done those kind of things. But the passing game, it is brutal. I mean, the route concepts are, they're laughable. I mean, this is something that at a middle school level, I think people would laugh at what they're trying to do in the passing scheme. When you see something like that and say they do, Brian Ferentz takes one for the team, doesn't want to have his, tarnishes his dad's legacy, he moves on, and they bring in an offensive coordinator. How quickly can you change that? I mean, is that something, even knowing that recruiting hasn't gone very well, how deep is the wide receiver crew? With the schematic change in the passing game and a competent quarterback, say Cade McNamara coming back for next year, how quickly can you change that? It depends on what they would be able to do with the JUCO player and or with the transfer portal. I don't care how good your scheme is. You could bring back what are like Todd Munkin was at Georgia the last few years and they won the national title. He's not the friendliest guy from what I've heard and I'm being kind, but he's as good a play caller as there was in college football. Kirby kind of made up for his lack of recruiting because that was not what Munkin was going to do, but he just wanted him up in the booth. <laughs> Iowa needs somebody that's elite, and they also need some kind of immediate impact on the perimeter. I, even if you had Munkin, though, with these receivers, you're not you're not going anywhere. I mean, they've also had, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, they're down to like three or four receivers that are healthy. I mean, they haven't had exactly the greatest of luck. So it's just like, you know, piling on and, you know, gas on the fire. So at least two transfer receivers though, or a Juco kid, you can't just rely on some freshman coming in. Otherwise it would still be bad next year, even with a very talented offense coordinator. Cause it's about the dudes on the outside. You know, I mean, like look at the Ohio state Penn state game last weekend, Penn state's defense is legit. I mean, you guys saw it. Marvin Harrison is still Marvin Harrison. So, you know, that's that's the bottom line. You you don't necessarily need Marvin, although that would help, but you need somebody that can just win 50-50 balls. And Iowa doesn't have that right now. The only thing I think they can do short-term this year is put Cooper over there on offense. I mean, that's yep. about it. I mean, he's – holy cow, is that kid good? But they just don't have a guy to throw it to. So, for instance, he's not a good coordinator, but, like, he doesn't have anything, and the next guy may not unless they do something drastic this offseason. Mm-hmm. Another step in this and on your recruiting side, you hear a lot of the stories and you've told us some of the stories here about just all different things in the recruiting world. It's a different business, right? A little shady at times. 
and the negative recruiting. Now, I, I go back, I mean, we're talking about, I think, a decade plus back, and Michigan State was negative recruiting Iowa, saying Kirk Ferentz is hanging it up. Well, that was a decade ago. He outlasted D'Antonio and that staff. He's still around, but he is an aging coach. This is a guy approaching 70 years old. And that neg- I, even negative recruiting has well, a negative connotation here. It's not negative recruiting. It's just, hey, do you think that guy is going to be there? How difficult is it for an aging coach? And not just Kirk Ferentz, but any aging coach. When you're getting up there, you think of Joe Paul at Penn State and how it started to go at the end of his regime there with the Nittany Lions and so many other places. We see what's happening in North Carolina. Mac Brown is still doing a good job and still recruiting at a high level. So how do you do that? I think I was done a good job of saying, hey, been here for 25 years. But the negative side, when other schools are kind of talking about it, how do you combat that as a recruiter? There's only so much you can do because your age is your age. That's, you know, part of the gig. And and I don't think anybody on that staff is doubting the head coach in terms of his acumen, but I think it's more about how does he relate? And then parents always want to know which guy is going to be in charge of my kid. There's no way around that. It's only human nature. So trying to think like, except for Saban, who almost doesn't count on any scale because he's the rarest of the rare. He's over 70, and they're obviously recruiting different, but that's Alabama. You know, that's it's not real hard to recruit there with their staff and their money. There just isn't a good sign for guys that are around the 70-year-old age and above anywhere. That's a problem. And kids don't relate to those guys as well. Parents worry. So unless you have just an unbelievable juggernaut as a head coach, like Mac Brown loves recruiting. He doesn't like it. He loves it. I don't think that the man in Iowa yeah. City is going to fit that profile very much. He's just a heck of a coach. Mm-hmm. But it's Iowa, too. It's easier to sell North Carolina because you're just recruiting locally. It's not that hard. I think that it's going to be a problem that's going to get worse with time. And having his son screw it up on the offense is part of that problem, too. So, yeah, I, I don't know what they can do. I, I think, in all honesty, the best thing – is for the head man to step aside and to start all over because it's just, he's not going to fire his kid. And I don't, I have no idea why, you know, why would Kirk do that? I get it. Uh, go home to your wife after you fire your son, see how well that goes. Um, right. I, I, <laughs> I mean, seriously, that would be really awkward. Uh, how, what'd yes. you do today? Uh, <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, your oldest boy. Um, you know, your grandkids aren't going to be here anymore. He's going to be not in Iowa City anymore. And yeah, that, that would not be a fun conversation. Um, <laughs> yeah, go ahead, I don't Brian. Know, man. No, no, it just, yeah. I don't know how you, how you can fix it other than to blow it up. Because even if he is there, what OC that he would go after? And Iowa would throw money at people, don't get me wrong. Who would want to be under him because he's such a conservative-minded offensive coach historically? What what reason would you have to go there unless you just got it in writing that I call the plays and you just stand over there and you're just kind of a figurehead? Maybe yeah. a coach in waiting as an OC. That's the only way I could see them getting the guy they really would want. Yeah. I don't know if that's going to sit real well with somebody that's been the head man for 25 years. Just my opinion. Yeah, I, I think you're exactly right on that front. Well, one recruiting note, he's down in your area, down in Florida, and that is the commit for 2020. 2024 at the quarterback position in James Rezar. We've talked about James in the past with you, a guy that, you know, athletically is incredible. I mean, the speed that he has, he's a track star. He's a guy that can move as a quarterback, throwing the football, pretty big part of it though. There's definitely been some questions. So what have you seen from him this season? Any improvements or is it kind of same, the the same kind of questions that we had about him accuracy wise, making those passes football wise, that still is a concern with Rezar. It's a little bit of a difficult scenario. He he plays at a smaller program in Jacksonville. It's not that they haven't had guys over the years, but he's not throwing at the same dudes that like Bailey is down at Chaminade Madonna, who's got like four power five kids. So yeah. it's it's a little harder. Um, I could throw to the kids at Chaminade Madonna, <laughs> but it, it's it's still a situation where he's a developing player. He would need to redshirt. They might have to tweak his motion some. I, I think they will but the athleticism is there. He would at least present you with a long-term option in the run-pass option game and this the quarterback run game. Think about how many teams have burned Iowa with just that one big play 
Iowa's defense plays great almost every week. But if you drop seven and you make the first guy miss in a quarterback scramble, there's a lot of grass. Those kind of plays drive coaches nuts, but that's that's what a mobile quarterback can do. That's what James does. And I've seen him live. He can flat out run. So, yeah, I think he's getting a little bit better, but I, I don't know exactly because of the high school he's at watching this film. How many guys is he really throwing to that I would compare to the Power 5 slash Big Ten level? Probably not any. So I, I think we're just going to have to wait and see once he gets to Iowa and hopefully under a new quarterback and OC. Yeah. That's the hope, I think, for most of every Hawkeye fan out there. Brian, always enjoy Absolutely. our conversations. We'll be doing it a whole lot more as we're uh, coming down to that time, less than two months away from the first signing day out there. Iowa's class is basically a sign sealed and delivered at this point, but there's always things that move, always things that change, and we will get into that as we get closer to December. Brian, as always, appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Have a great day. That's Brian Smith joining us here, our Locked On analyst here that helps us out on the recruiting front. Always fun jumping in with him and talking about everything. And our recruiting interviews are brought to you by LinkedIn Jobs. We continue, well, a lot of football talk. Let's hit a little hoops. Is there reason for optimism with this Iowa basketball team? We will do that as we continue. This is the Locked On Hawkeyes podcast. Today's episode of Locked On Hawkeyes is brought to you by FanDuel and the FanDuel Sportsbook. Snap into action this NFL season with FanDuel. It's America's number one sportsbook right now. New customers, you can get $200 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place a $5 bet. That's $200 in bonus bets, win or lose. Love the way that sounds. If you've been thinking about joining FanDuel, there's no better time to get on the action. We got NBA. Up and running. We got the NHL. We have the World Series set as we get ready for that to start on Friday. And of course, all the football, NFL, college football, they have you covered. The app, super easy to use, super user friendly. You can hop on there and find a wide range of betting options, not just the point spreads. They have player props. You can get into over unders. I like playing in the futures market, taking a look at teams, trying to find that big price and see if it comes home. Hey, if you had the Rangers and Diamondbacks playing in the World Series, yeah, you're cashing a really nice ticket. Visit fanduel.com slash locked on and kick off the NFL season right. FanDuel, official partner of the NFL. Trent kind of back with you one final time on the Locked On Hawkeyes podcast. So a lot of negativity in the football world. Basketball, men's basketball has been a well a topic that we just haven't touched very much. And the main reason for that, look, I love Iowa basketball. Iowa basketball is my first love. It was the first sport that I fell in love with. And growing up in the 80s, it was, well, the only sport that I was able to watch during the week because they had three channels. And during the week, there was not sports programming on those three channels, except for on Thursday nights. And then over the weekend, you'd get an Iowa basketball game during the winter. And that's where my love of Iowa basketball started. It's where my love of sports really built was because of those Thursday nights watching Hawkeye hoops. And this team this season, the optimism is difficult to find. Look, they're going to score. This team's going to put the bucket in. And they're going to get buckets because that's what Fran McCaffrey does. Fran McCaffrey could take you, me, and three other dopes, and you'd be able to score. I mean, just it's the way he is. He is an elite offensive coach. However, defensively, they're always poor. Outside of the final two seasons of Adam Woodbury in the middle and Mike Gasell and that crew and Anthony Clemens, outside of their junior and senior years, this team has been anywhere from bad to brutal defensively every single year. And this team on paper looks to be maybe one of the worst of the bunch. It's a scary place to be when you take a team that already struggles defensively and you take a step back. Will they score? Absolutely. Will they be in a lot of games? Sure. Will they blow somebody out and maybe even a really good team because they're shooting well from the outside? Yeah, that's going to happen too. But will it be enough to at least put this team, say in the middle of February, in NCAA tournament consideration? I just didn't think so. And that's why it made it difficult to talk about this. And of course, with all the hype coming into the year of Iowa football, it made it even more difficult. However, as this team is going to score, and maybe this team is a better three-point shooting team than they were a year ago. You look at the offensive numbers last year, and you say, of course, they're scoring at a high level. You look at a place like Ken Palm that measures offensive efficiency. The Iowa basketball team was very good a season ago, once again, but they were not a consistent three-point shooting. And short of the road game against Indiana, they really struggled on the road shooting the basketball. 
Well, if the backcourt is going to be Tony Perkins and Josh Dix, and basically them kind of handling the point guard duties together. You put that together with Patrick McCaffrey, that can shoot the basketball. Peyton Sanford, that can shoot the crap out of the ball. And Ben Cricky, who is not a great outside shooter, but can knock down an open shot from the outside. And of course, what he's going to do in the middle. Plus the bench pieces that they have. I think this team is going to shoot the ball a little bit better from the three-point line, and that is something to get excited about. I mentioned that point guard spot, and that's going to be so interesting to see. If they do play out like I anticipate, where it is Perkins and Dix starting in the backcourt, and then those two guys basically handling the point guard duties together. What do we see out of the two backup point guards, if you will? If they go with DeSante Bowen coming off the bench. Fran McCaffrey said he believed that he didn't play him enough a year ago. Well, you get him more minutes this year, and he becomes a role that even if it's 12, 15 minutes a game, how does he look in that kind of role? A guy that off the dribble is about as good as anybody as I was had at the point guard position in a really long time. I mean, very well might have to go all the way back to Bryce Cartwright since they had a point guard quite like that in Fran's first season. I mean, that's how back we're, how far back we're going when you're talking about a break it down kind of point guard. And then Brock Harding, who is small, who is... Not a big dude, and he's going to get eaten up defensively a lot of times out there. But offensively, anybody that has watched this kid play, Mr. Basketball in the state of Illinois a year ago, he just has something about him. And what kind of role does he find this year? Those are going to be a couple of the intriguing moments. I'm excited about Owen Freeman. He did not play in the scrimmage that they had against Wichita. Iowa won that game against Wichita. Wichita was out without a couple of their uh, guys anticipated that they were going to start. But overall, We'll see with this team. Look, Frey McCaffrey deserves a ton of credit. I don't know. March success, NCAA tournament success has not been there for Frey McCaffrey. But the consistent winner that he has put on the court over the last decade needs to be commended. I think this is going to be the most difficult year for them to put out a season like we've seen. Even to be a bubble type of team in the middle of February. But Fran, he's done it many times before. We'll see if he can do it again. That'll do it for today here on Locked On Hawkeyes. Thanks for making Locked On Hawkeyes your first listen every day. Coming up on Friday, it is LaShawn Daniels, former Hawkeye running back. He will stop in. Excited to get LaShawn in here. We will talk everything going on in Iowa football and get a former player's perspective. And, of course, a week from Friday, that's right, the day before the game in Wrigley, we'll be doing a live Locked On Hawkeyes podcast from Merkel's. It's the Hawkeye Bar in Wrigleyville. We'll be doing that at about 2 o'clock Friday afternoon. Stop on out, hang out with LaShawn and myself. We'll be having a few cocktails, having some good food, and having a great time at Merkel's in Wrigleyville. That's coming up on Friday. I'll be doing my radio show before that from 11 till 1, so make sure to stop on out, say hello with us, hang out, and get ready to cheer on the Hawkeyes on Saturday. We'll talk to you again tomorrow with the former Hawkeye, LaShawn Daniels. As always, thanks for making Locked On Hawkeyes your first listen every day. Thanks to Brian Smith as well for joining us, our Locked On recruiting analyst. We'll talk to you again tomorrow. Go Hawks.